welcome everybody in the reinstallation of quantum information and quantum computing seminar of Center for Theoretical Physics. So today we have a first uh, hybrid seminar, so sorry for a bit of delay. Uh, we have a pleasure to host uh, uh, Ingo Ruf, who is a senior researcher in Technology Innovation Institute in Abu Dhabi. Ingo is a prolific researcher working on uh, quantum algorithms, benchmarking, characterization of quantum devices. And today he'll be uh, telling us about his fresh work uh, on uh, some rigorous guarantees for non-uniform randomized benchmarking. Uh, it's great to have you, Ingo. The, uh, yeah, the floor is here. Thank you very much for the invitation, Miho, and thank you for all attending here and thanks for the opportunity to present this work and also to the unlimited numbers of people on the internet. So maybe just one word of explanation. Um, yeah, the Technology Institu uh, Innovation Institute is a new place which was founded in Abu Dhabi as part of like, I mean, their effort to move, uh, to move like a commodity-based economy to um, a knowledge-based economy. And so it's a, it's a serious research effort and we are there having a quantum research center with like a, different groups and different experimental efforts in quantum communication and also quantum computing uh, and theory groups uh, doing this. So it's a very good place. I mean, if you want to learn more, just ask me. I mean, we also have a very good visitor program. Okay. And one of the things I've been working there and I mean, actually exploring with a lot of other people is um, kind of like, I mean, understanding the general theory of randomized benchmarking. And this is actually something which I started together with Jonas Helsen and Emilio Onovati, Albert Werner and Jens Eisert a couple of years ago already. And then now the work I'm presenting is more, the, my recent work together with Markus Heinrich and Martin Klich. And I want to especially highlight Markus, who did like, I mean, um, a lot of the, the work which you see in it actually, I mean, uh, is, is uh, Right. And then if I have time in the end, I will also um, talk a bit, like very briefly mention kind of like where we are going to in another project. Okay, as Mia already mentioned, I mean, the work is fresh from the old one. So I mean, it has been going on for some quite some time, but it actually appeared on the archive today. So I'm very happy to I mean, give you already like spare the hassle of even reading through it with this um, presentation. Okay, so it's about general guarantees for non-uniform randomized benchmarking, and maybe in the end, which is just an output. Um, so the question is, what is randomized benchmarking to start? So I would like to to kind of like call the overarching field of like different quantum of different methods there, quantum device characterization, and when it comes to randomized benchmarking, there's already kind of a of an ambiguity in the name. Like, I mean, what does it actually mean to benchmark a device? So if you think of, of characterizing a quantum device, let's say a supercomputer qubit device, you get, can characterize it on different layers of abstraction. You can characterize it on kind of like the physical layers, like on the pulse level or the actual physics that happens in a transform qubit. You can characterize like the abstract gate layer. So like talking about density matrices or processes, you can characterize on the logical layer or at some point on the application. And then on each layer, you can have different tasks. And it, Apparently, I mean, like the, the most important task that I've been working on most of the time is on the abstract gate layer. So everything is kind of like unitary. If it's perfect process, if it's, if it's, uh, if it's actually implemented on the device, so it's kind of like already abstracting from the actual physics underneath in terms of Hamiltonian. Um, and then on this layer, you can have different tasks. For example, there's the task of identifying kind of like an object in some under class, let's say, learn a quantum state, doing tomography of a quantum state or a quantum process tomography. There's the task of learning, which is related, but a different, a different because you only want to have learn like one uh, point in an ansatz class that generalizes on your data, instead of like nailing a unique uh, point. There's estimation, which is kind of like, okay, given let's say some fidelity, you an average fidelity between two uh, processes, try to estimate that plus minus some, some error. There's the, the task of certification, which like abstractly speaking, just means you give the device a specification, it should nail the fidelity larger than that and that, and then you just certify that meets that specification. And they are like, I mean, different ways on the application level, it's often called verification. There's like property testing, like membership to problems, you can write different specifications, so you can have different schemes of certification. And then there's benchmarking, which I mean, if you narrow it down only means like, 
I give you one device, I give you another device, and you should compare which is better in some measure of quality or one device. Yes. And um, there might also be validation, though I don't want to what it means. Um, the problem with randomized benchmarking is that kind of like, I mean, randomized benchmarking techniques have been developed for kind of like the entire stack. So originally it was kind of like knowing how good a gate is, but people also use it to actually derive a certificate to interpret a number. People even use it to estimate fidelities nowadays and report them on the web pages. And people also even do can do tomographic estimates. For example, you can tomographically estimate uh, processes from randomized benchmarking data. So randomized benchmarking actually like, I mean, captures all of this, but I mean, the most important part is still kind of, it's a protocol that gives you all the number and there are different devices with that number. The more information you want to learn, the more um, complexity and the something you actually need to put in. So like also just having a benchmark, just a reproducible number is also like the, the minimum desiderata which you can have on the scheme without like assuming anything on the noise which you actually need for tomorrow. Let me also highlight two resources on like, I mean, quantum device characterization more generally, there's the nature review from a couple of from two years now back, um, which kind of like puts out the entire landscape of characterization techniques at that time. And there's also like a tutorial already appearing there on quantum certification, which kind of more deep dive into the technical mathematical framework. Which so if you are interested in this more. So this talk will be about benchmarking. And what is the, I, the general idea of randomized benchmarking is very um, following. If you, I mean, at least a couple of years ago, people had the problem and still have the problem of like, I mean, characterizing a quantum gate on a device where you prepare a state, you apply that gate, do some measurement. And then if you observe some data, it's actually like just linear in that gate and there's some spam noise. So some error in the state preparation and measurement that kind of like makes this in. So your estimate of the, of the actually of the gate you want to characterize is very susceptible to the, the imperfections which you have in your measurement and your state. And if you don't ask me how, how to mitigate like readout noise or something like this, you, I mean, you don't get good estimates about the process. But I mean, there's a simple idea to go, go beyond this, which is just, you apply the gate multiple times. What does that mean? Because I can do that with a process. Then your data just becomes some polynomial in the entries of that gate. Okay. And then, but the spam still enters linear. Yes. Whatever you do on the mirror. I mean, whatever you do, whatever you post process in the sense, like, I mean, if you think of this as the form for possibility system, which is kind of like the, the, the statistic of measurements, yeah. Or even like, or like, a, yeah, you can even mix it to an observable estimator or something like that makes the thing. Of course, you can do this with the post process, you can do more crazy things. But in principle, the things which come out kind of like very roughly, it's just a function dependent. Yeah. Think of this just as like a form for this. Okay. And, but you still stay linear in the spam. So you might hope that like with this type of data, you can actually just from the different functional dependencies, extract the parameters of the U independent or robustly again, distinguish between the different things. Um, so if you do some uh, functional fit, you can actually to spam robustly characterize. That's the general idea. And how does that work in a randomized benchmarking experiment. A randomized benchmarking experiment is kind of like the idea that you do a monkey test with your quantum computer. You just have some controls to do some, um, to press some buttons, and then you just give it a monkey, you randomly press the button, and then you deal with the output. And, okay, we are working here in the, the noisy gate set model. So we need time stationary, uh, time independent and stationary in uh, Markovian noise. So I just want to say, whenever you press a button, let's say the button corresponding to the operation G1, then there's some process happening on that device. So the intention is actually to implement some gate corresponding to this. So omega G will now be some reference representation or some target representation, which is just your joint action of the, the button which I press typically. There will be initial state, which is fixed. There will be a computational measure, basis measurement in the end. And then what actually happens on the device will just be some other map taking some elements from the group, let's say just a unitary group involving all the operations of a universal quantum computer to some. So if, and the, also the state and the measurement can be noisy. So in this model, 
basically with such an implementation map, it's already kind of like restricted in the assumption. So for example, no, no non-Macrovian effects uh, are allowed. So it's, it's a process. Then with this random single shot, uh, sorry, a single shot experiment would just be one sequence of these gates, G1 to GM, some sequence here. And then you just sample once and you get an output from the probability distribution, which is just captured by like your implementation map and the bond probability with all the noise. So this is just a single thing. And now when you do randomized benchmarking, you randomize the single shot experiment. So you just define some measure on your sequence. Let's call it mu of a sequence length M. And then you, you draw a sequence according to that measure and you just repeat. So effectively, what you should think about is you just draw some pair of like an output click I and some sequence G of length M from the probability distribution, which is kind of the born probability is I given G. Okay. And so the data which we get out of these type of experiments will always be some a list of tuples I. So this is kind of like the setting for randomness benchmark. Okay. Now, what is standard randomized benchmarking? Standard randomized benchmarking, you take G to be a group um, and you define the uniform measure on the group. Let's say, think of this as a multi qubit Clifford group, and then you draw a, ran, a uniformly random Clifford gate. And then in the original proposal of randomized benchmarking, you would actually draw all the gates IID from in the sequence from this measure. And the last gate, you would choose such that it's inverse. So the last gate is just like, I mean, choosing that the entire sequence becomes self-inverting. So in an ideal implementation of that sequence, you would not do anything. What does that mean? If I now look at the survival probability of my initial state, and I just look whether it's still in the zero state, I would get... Yes. Yes. Exactly. So you, you start with one state and then you check whether the measurement is the state. And if if you use a self-inverting signal, you should just get like a like a survival probability of one. So it should just be a constant signal. Now, if you have noisy gates, you and the there comes noise in with every gate implementation. So you would assume that your signal just goes down somehow and it goes down with the signal because the more gates you use, the more noise you introduce, you wouldn't observe some exponential decay. Um, so you will have something of the form a b to the m plus p. So this is a very simple uh, functional form. You can just make the fit, you can extract the, the p. And now the, the noise in the spam will actually only enter these constants a and b, while the, 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 the strength of the noise in the implementation map will actually be in that p. And under some assumptions, you can even relate this p to an average gate fidelity of your implementation. Um, but we don't have to go. So this is the case for, for example, the Clifford group or any unitary two group. Um, this very the this theme of, of, of standard RB has been played in many, many different things. So you can now change the group. So you can choose a real subgroup of the Clifford group. You can choose the dihedral group, your C not dihedral group. Um, you can choose a group which acts like another representation of a group that just acts on, on multiple qubits simultaneously and so on. So like, I mean, a lot of work has been done um, on this. You can do this on the logical level. Um, and, but I mean, and all these works kind of like came, I mean, 2018, 19, when we started uh, looking at this came with like different amounts of guarantees. So like, I mean, some of them like throw in more assumptions to actually prove their data form they want to fit. Some of them prove less assumption. Uh, most of them did not address gate dependent noise so that you actually have an implementation map. So there we, we wrote a paper in uh, 2020, which we called a general framework for randomized benchmarking, where we actually try to, to give a single mathematical framework and a single guarantee that basically captures all of these theorems, uh, all of these, these schemes and derives the data form of all of them under a kind of minimal assumption. So this is what I what I think about with general guarantee. So how does such a general guarantee look like. Um, so all these schemes can be captured by the, the following ingredients. So in the end, you have like uh, some representation that you want to do. 
let's say the adjoint action of the group or like simultaneously on, on single qubits or something like this. This representation will somehow decompose into irreducible representations potentially with some uh, multiplicity. Okay. Yes, yes. In standard RBG, no. I mean, worst case is they are also based on this. Yes. I'll, I'll come to, I mean, there will always be a group. I mean, worst case, the, Yes, exactly. I mean, you need to, the group for two reasons. The, the one thing is, I mean, you want, okay, for the inversion, obviously you need to be able to actually like have a group and be able to, but, um, and to do the last thing. The other reason is you want a simple signal which you can fit in the end. So if you, if you, I mean, the group structure will actually give you exactly in this reason, I will come to that, that, that your signal is not arbitrary complex, some polynomial which you want to fit. But it's actually like a decay, like a matrix exponential decay with only a few decay parameters described. And I, like, I mean, I'll now make precise what I mean with a few decay parameters. So if you, if you have a group and if, you have a, if you're targeting at the representation of the group with the uniform measure, then you have the following guarantee. And assume that your implementation is already pretty good in the sense of that. Um, here it's kind of like in diamond in, in diamond norm distance your um, your implementation map is close to actually what you want to do but then average over the group uh, and there is some bound which just comes out like I mean one nines because we want to kind of like treat this perturb uh, perturbatively so in order for perturbation theory to kick in we need some initial belief on the the quality of the implementation map. this is one way to formalize it. But since you're averaging over the group, I mean, basically like single gates would actually even have a fairly large diamond norm. And also like one nine, not very uh, So if you are, have some initial belief in the implementation um, of, your, of, your, of, your, uh, of your implementation map, the quality of your implementation, then you can prove the following theorem. Your data as a function of the sequence length will actually just look as a sum of matrix exponential decays where you have like a matrix I lambda for every irrep, so like for every irreducible representation of that omega, there's one decay appearing here. And that I lambda will actually be a matrix of size multiplicity times multiplicity. And then there's some, uh, and the, the I lambda will actually only depend on the reference map, uh, on the, sorry, on the implementation map, and the A lambda will actually only depend. So you, you literally see like, I mean, you have a matrix, the, the, exponential form which you can potentially fit and, and extract just something like a like a decay parameter only depending on the implementation um, yes. so the general guarantee is some initial belief okay we know we have some some reference some group structure and some irreducible representation of the thing which we actually want to do then we can derive how we expect that data to look like under some initial belief on the form. Um, and for example, I mean, okay, why does it look so complicated? For example, if you use the Clifford group, which is a unitary two group, then it acts irreducibly basically on the entire space of Grayson's matrices. So this will just be a sum of two exponential decays, no multiplicities involved. So there will only be two scalar decays and the one decay is even for identity one. Person. So this is the reason why you only get one decay. You don't have the group structure and you don't target the group structure. I mean, not, I mean, things can, Okay, so this is kind of like, I mean, what we, what we were able to prove for the uniform measure and the group, but this is not what people do in practice. For example, if you think of the Google experiment where they just like do a random circuit and then they basically uh, compare to the classical simulation, people do something completely different, which is people actually don't use the uniform measure of the group. You still have an underlying group, but you just draw with some measure from it, which might be, for example, a random circuit, involving some measure of local gates or like even like some uniform measure of a generator. So you can just like put in some measure and then generate. So what people are actually doing is the same type of experiment, but with a different measure where say still IID, you just do like, I mean, the sequence of M gates, but with some measure. No inversion. 
there's a scheme uh, how, which is kind of like a general random benchmarking scheme which um, which kind of like captures what you should do in these cases and interestingly I mean there are already a couple of prominent examples of that scheme which uh, I mean, we like to call filtered randomized benchmarking and these examples include for example like the linear cross entropy benchmarking or the character benchmarking for Jonas Helsen or Steve Lamias and Joe Warman's Pauli channel tomography and maybe in the future also analog scheme. So if you, if you know, like, I mean, you get this, the data with still these, these topics. So you get one click, one sequence, one click, and then a list of them. From the, so what can you do actually to build some scalar estimate? What you can do is you can define one function, which takes a sequence and takes the click and maps to the real numbers. And then you can, I mean, over all your IID samples, you can define an empirical mean estimator. And then um, what you want to show is actually the, know the, the, the functional dependency when you like now take a lot of samples where this mean estimator actually goes, which is the same as looking at the single shot estimator, which gives you kind of like your randomized benchmark signal. So we now want to derive like a form for this filtered data signal, which we define in terms of, of this function evaluated on all your. So you evaluate, I give you all the, these clicks which you have in the experiment, like one sequence which you draw, one output, and then a list of them, all IID. Now I make the, a scale out of them by introducing the function, which I will define in a second, and then I do the empirical. And I mean, you can think of this as a general, like I'm introducing some dual to like on the on the group. This kind of like the freedom with which you can play, and um, you can also like do tomographic estimates and can do crazy things here. But this is another paper, another talk. But I mean, in filtered randomized benchmarking, you are using a very particular um, correlator function or like filter function here, which where you can actually define a filter function for every irreducible representation. While every irreducible representation, because here we had a sum of irreducible representation and fitting many exponential decays might become cumbersome. So we want to maybe uh, filter out an individual irreducible representation. So how can we do that? We can just define a function here, which basically just simulates the experiments for us, which is we take the state, we project it to the irreducible representation, we introduce that operator, which I'll define in a second, and then we just like, I mean, basically do what, should, I mean, simulate what should happen in the ideal experiment, and then the response. And the, the only non trivial ingredients, in a sense, is this projection onto one irreducible representation, which basically makes this a character function. On the group um, and this one map which is kind of like inverting the effective measurement um, so we define just the the effective measurement as the the measurement which happens and then like spitting out the same the same state so this is basically the dephasing channel and z basis and then we can just like i mean do the uniform twirl now still with the uniform measure of over like the representation and by defining this like this, this means if I do the experiment, I come with a state in here. I do like, I mean, in the ideal case, I would just like do a random uniform representation of that group. I do the measurement and I do this. So this is actually effectively what happens in the experiment. And I just use pseudo. We'll see in, the, in a second that this is. And now to analyze these type of data, there's a single mathematical tool which comes in handy, which kind of like formalizes the entire thing. Uh, which is basically the Fourier transform over uh, groups for operator value function. Because our implementation map was taking a group element, but pressed, giving me the CPT map, the process that actually happens. So I now want to talk about the, the Fourier transform of that, because this is uh, what will, will be captured by the data. So people, 
with this filtering. Okay, with this filtering. So now people uh, actually measure from some for uh, like okay. First of all, this signal had like a sum of different characters of representation, so it's nice to be able to target the single characters. Second, there was no inversion in the data now, so now we don't have a have a uniform one. Field. So now you actually want to introduce, I mean, you can introduce some function here. This is like inversion, what you can do. Choosing it with a function like this, which actually does the inversion in the post processing sense. And like, I mean, normalize the function with, with that one inverse properly, basically will, as you see in a second, give you a concept. So it's kind of like mimicking what the idea, the standard randomized benchmark would do, but okay. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yes. Which is also important because I mean, if I have an arbitrary measure, I can just not do it. So, I mean, running that circuit might be easy, but doing that one, like compiling that one multi qubit unit is uneasy. The group is still complicated. Like, worst case, the group is just as you. There's just one group around. Um, so now the, the Fourier transform is basically just the generalization of the channel to for an implementation. So if I, I just define the linear operator, which acts from the right with this implementation map and from the left with some reduced representation, so just sandwiches and then it twirls with that method. So this is just if this would be the adjoint representation. This is also the adjoint representation. This is the uniform measure, so omega evaluated at omega. That's basically just what we know as the channel tool, eating a map. This is also not. Um, okay, you would define this for irreducible representation, and then you can just like I mean, basically patch together the different values, like block diagonally the different values for different representation to also allow it to, to get like I mean other representations that are not irreducible. Okay, if you have some representation and you evaluate the Fourier transform at some irreducible representation, then, I mean, another way to phrase Schur's lemma in that context is just that this will just be a rank one. Because it I mean, basically just, you can draw like your, an element in that representation on the one side, get it out on the other side. So it has to be put to project onto the commutant. And then Schur's lemma tells you that the commutant can only be the identity on that irreducible representation. So in the end, like the Fourier transform of an um, individual representation will just be a rank multiplicity project. Okay. And okay, one example, which is maybe familiar. So the channel twirl would then just be the Fourier transform of my adjoint representation to value it at the adjoint representation. And then I can, for example, evaluate it at the, like, at the defacing channel on that basis. And if I use the Clifford group, which is the two design, this would just look like a depolarizing channel. So this is the polyluria representation. So the identity gets mapped to the identity and the traceless matrices. So there it's, it's projecting onto the depolarizing channel. Yes, exactly. Just to, to give some familiar, maybe familiar. Yes, exactly. If I don't don't use the okay, yeah, the normal Fourier transform which you would define is with the Haar measure, and then like you can generalize the correct function. Yeah, and okay, like just as a reference, the standard Fourier transform you can also just see it as functions from U one to C, which is the blue space. So you can also like I mean, just plug in this construction into here and you just find. Now, if you want to understand what randomized benchmarking actually is doing, there's one calculation which fits on a napkin, which you might, might have to do at some point. So this is the napkin, um, which is we want to understand now what is, the, what is the data. So this was the data. We measure clicks from a quantum experiment with the probability, which is like we draw a sequence from some measure nu to the m, g, and then there's a born probability of observing the click i given that sequence. So this is now 
or a click. And then this is the function which we evaluate. So in the end, this is just the expectation value of that function. This is the signal which we, which we want to understand. Okay. If you write this out, there will be a, a long expression, but which has a very simple structure, which is there's the row coming in. Then there's kind of like the, all the phi is happening on the machine. This is the bond probability to phi gm to phi g1. And then there's the dephasing channel in the z basis. So this is the half here is the bond probability. And then this is was the alpha, where I had like the another probability, like the, the another POVM element of the z measurement, and then the ideal implementation, and then the S uh, inverse P lambda row. So what this is, is basically you have the dephasing channel. And then here, it's just the Fourier transform of that omega of, uh, sorry, of phi evaluated omega acting on that channel one. And then again, and again, and again, and again. So in the end, you just have the Fourier transform of your implementation map and the measure to the power of M an operator evaluated at omega eating the dephasing channel in the, in the Z basis, and then looking at one matrix element. And since we throw in one projector, we can basically just look at the Fourier transform at one finger use to either type of thing So, okay, it's, a nice, it's, it's not a complicated, but it's a, it's a convoluted calculation. But what comes out is actually a very, very easily interpreted. So in the end, what you're observing in a randomized benchmarking experiment is just a matrix power of the Fourier transform of the input. Um, and evaluated at something which depends on the, on the measurement and then looking at some matrix element. So what does that mean? If this is, I mean, in the ideal case, yeah, so omega is a representation, the state is ideal, the MZ is ideal, then the Fourier transform evaluated at the representation was just projector, just a rank and lambda projector. So taking it to the power of M will just give the projector. Then evaluating this on the MZ was just our definition of that as lambda, which we just inverted. So we we'll just see the state, like the, the fidelity of that state uh, in that irreducible representation, which will just give us that one six. So in the ideal case, we now just build a projector and we just see the matrix power of that projector. But now here we will have some with, with some noise, we have some perturbation of that projector. So it will still like live predominantly in one subspace. But we actually, I mean, we take to the power of M. So this will just give us the dominant eigenspace, like stay in the dominant eigenspace. It will boost the dominant eigenspace of that thing. So in the sense, you can capture randomized benchmarking as kind of like the power method in Fourier. So we are effectively just looking at the dominant eigenspace of the Fourier transform. And this is kind of like well. You know, So if you perturbatively analyze this, um, the reason why Cygnus and RB look so simple and these general guarantees, you can do the following thing. If you have the uniform measure for warm up and you take the Fourier transform of that implementation map, evaluate it at the one reduced representation, it's the projector plus then some perturbation. If you're not doing a perfect job, you have noise in the experiment in your implementation. That means the original thing kind of like has a dominant subspace where you project to some basis x1 and the and the so in some basis the projector will just look like this and then there's still some perturbation to the model. Now if this E is small, like then you can perturbatively treat this and you know that the eigenspace will be approximately invariant. So there will still be the uh, structure of invariant eigenspaces which is aligned with the similar structure, maybe a bit tilted, but basically there will still be a dominant eigenspace of that dimension and uh, the subdominant eigenspace of that dimension. So the reason why randomized benchmarking works from this perspective is basically you can open your, your favorite book on matrix perturbation theory and then just find that if you perturb a rank and lambda projector, you will still get something which is close to rank lambda projector plus some perturbation, the perturbation of the kernel in and then some like distortion of the eigenvalues, but still you have the same structure. 
Now, if we take a matrix power, we'll basically only see this, and this will be suppressed with the exponent. So if this perturbation E is small, and this is basically what our assumption, but now in spectral norm and restricted to irreducible representation, then um, also this perturbation of the kernel will be small, and with the sequence length, this perturbation will actually go down, and we'll only see like the, the matrix exponential of this term. So what you're seeing is kind of like the dominant subspace we transform in your signal, and this is also the reason why it has like the dimension of the multiplicity because it's actually the perturbation of a multiplicity um, project. This is for the Hamid on. Okay. Now. The question is what happens if you don't have the harm measure? If you don't have the harm measure, then this is still a moment operator of that respective representation evaluates on that error. And there will be some subdominant subspace, which is not, I mean, uh, which is not a kernel anymore, but actually has some spectral norm. And one minus spectral norm is exactly the, the spectral gap of kind of like this random walk on the group when measured. So, when you prove convergence of, like, I mean, of, of random walks of, of random circuits, what you're actually trying is to bound that spectral gap. So, like, how far it actually goes down. So, this means you can basically do the same thing again with this control of that one irreducible representation. And you can just, like, I mean, bound this, uh, the spectral gap. So, where does the spectral gap appear, it will also appear one in your condition on your perturbation. So you have to, your perturbation has to be good with respect to the spectral gap. Um, but then, like, I mean, there's, I mean, you will have basically two decays, the one decay coming from like the random walk conversion to the uniform measure. And then the other decay would still like the, the perturbation of that uh, random walk um, going down. Okay. It's okay. You you perturb now something okay. in the absence of noise where delta is zero. Yes, you would just have like see like basically your random walk again to the uniform measure as measured in that irreducible representation. This that this decay. And but now you have a perturbation of that. Yeah. And then I mean this is kind of like I mean two contributions coming. One from I mean, from it's not two decays. I mean it's bounded as a single decay with that. No, 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 it's, 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 it's this, because I mean, it's one space in the proof also like, I mean, which is just upper bounded by already we, I mean, by having a spectral norm of like, I mean, like by the spectral gap plus like, and this is also the reason for this condition, because I mean, if your noise kind of flows, like, um, and then you recover the same, the same type of form. Now, Having this type of formula, so like a perturbation, perturbative expansion per irrep, and then looking at the signal of filtered RB, you can actually, and I mean, the actual dependence, you can look and what, like, I mean, how do random circuits, typically random circuits converge, um, and kind of like, I mean, work out um, how long you have to wait until this term actually is small so that you can actually start fitting your data with an exponential decay. So the story is the following. So there's some, some warm up time here until kind of like, I mean, your spectral gap is already converged. Like, I mean, it's already like, I mean, it has pushed down this contribution. And then you basically only see the dominant subspace. So you should wait until some initial sequence length, and then you can actually start fitting your B signal. And you, then you observe kind of like the same signal as before. Um, yes. And using like, I mean, specific results on, on, on these measures and spectral gaps of random walks, you can, on, on, on circuits, you can on circuit construction, you can just like work out what the minimal sequence length is. And for example, if you use like these fast scrambling circuit, circuits for example, like brickwork architectures with unitary two designs or even with generates the Clifford group, you would see that you actually have a linear dependence in the number of qubits of like the time you need to wait. While if you do like local random circuits, um, nothing on most of the qubits all the time, 
you end up with n squared. But in principle, like I mean, this gives you a framework. Give me the gate set that you can do. You pick a measure which you want to, to use for the benchmarking. You can see whether you can cook up a random assignment. If you know the representation of the group, you can cook up an experiment. When did we start and how long do I? Yes. Okay, this is an assumption which you would typically not test an experiment, but like, I mean, it's, in, it's an initial belief which you need in order to, to trust the experiment. Yeah. So for example, for a prick work circuit, you will have like a constant spectral gap. And then like, I mean, the, the one fourth of the spectral gap smaller than this kind of like, I mean, if you think about this and just plug in error models, I mean, you're, you're easily in that regime. Yes. If you use other uh, architectures where the, where the gap actually goes down with the number of qubits, yeah, then you're, you're actually in problem. So like, I mean, then, then the, the method, like, I mean, your gate quality needs to improve with the number of qubits in order to still be able to run. So um, there you, we are not looking at but you can um, okay yeah, i think okay we have okay sorry we we look at at a uh, nearest neighbor circuit and all to all connectivity which is not 2d but um yes and you can just i mean it's basically i mean the same structure like i mean you you still stay with the n squared of the ball. In the in the local random local random walk with also all exactly expanded nodes. I mean, you 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 literally met okay. You measure you measure that spectral gap with respect to the the It's literally the spectral norm on that. It's kind of like yeah, it's how you convert with that row design. So then um, this is kind of like the first, now we, we have established that, that signal for filter random benchmarking. So the experiment was, we do a random sequence, we do the clicks, we calculate a weird function, which basically should just give us an ideal signal in the absence of noise again. And then we can show under perturbative assumption that we, I mean, if we are in the correct regime, we basically get a signal which we can filter and which we can interpret as a quality measure for our input. Now you can ask, okay, is this still sample efficient? Standard randomized benchmarking was just checking whether the zero state is back after the sequence. So just the hufting bound basically gives you a sample efficiency of that individual. Now we basically inverted with like an effective measurement map without like, I mean, measuring in the correct basis. So we diluted our signal. We just like, I mean, measured in the big basis, the randomly um, rotated thing. So we actually, the the function we are evaluating will typically be of size of the dimension of the iterative representation. So for example, if we only have one iterative representation, the, the joint action, like the action on traces matrices, this would just give us the dimensional effect. Of the um, so our estimated exponentially large in the space. So the efficiency is not clear at all. This is a very similar situation as in shadow system, that you kind of like, you just blow up your signal in your in your post process. Because this this is wrong. So it's D plus one because it's only like, I mean, it's only the overlap of the dephasing channel with that or in the base with that zero that buys you another D and that I wrote the lambda here was wrong. It's kind of like it's very order. I mean, it depends on how your how your base kind of like lies in that. So, like, I mean, this D plus one is exactly. So, if you apply the channel twirl to the dephasing channel in the 
and the measurement looks like a depolarizing channel of strength. But what you can do, and this might also be an interesting tool for, I mean, beyond only random benchmarking, is you can also look at variance bounds in that Hilbert approximation. So instead of looking at the representation itself, you can look at a tensor, okay, at this representation itself, you can look at the second tensor for that representation. And this is exactly the one that appears in your variance of your estimate. And then you can, you, in general, you get a get a bunch of uh, representations, and you can also do the perturbative argument that you're still close to the ideal signal. And then you can try to bound actually your second moment, which appears in terms of the second moment of the ideal signal. And if you go through that uh, and throw in a couple of assumptions here and then, so I mean, it's a bit, a bit tricky, then you end up with deriving that your data set actually has a has a standard. Uh, variance type bound so you can just derive a sample complexity uh, in terms of the variance of the of the uh, of the your estimator as it would have under ideal conditions so without noise without spam over epsilon squared and over delta. changing the mean estimator to the median of means you can boost your confidence delta log one over delta but in principle i mean the, the core idea is that you can just like with this perturbation argument go back to the sample complexity of the ideal and then you can just calculate that ideal, like given the representation structures or for unitary theory designs, you can calculate the ideal variance and also derive the sample. And what you find is, for example, that for uh, unitary three designs, this is basically the sample complexity of fidelity estimation of shadow estimation with like a unitary three design. So you get an efficient answer, it's, it's a order of a constant. While, for example, if you do simultaneous RB with local groups, um, it's not efficient anymore. Scaling with basically the support of the era which you're looking at. There's also like a slightly intriguing uh, thing going on with, with qubits compared to for higher dimensional local groups. So like I mean, qubits have better scaling for filtered simultaneous RB by while only like for, for larger local dimensions. Um, this so you have a bit more happiness. So the, the paper is actually 77 pages long. So there are more examples of different way plugged in random walks uh, of different architecture, analyze them analytically and numerically, like fitting the decay to extract good vector gap bounds from other calculations. Um, yeah, so have a look at the preprint. And I also want to advertise that Marcos will give a example. Uh, and that's this. And how long do I have? We can either do Yeah, I can either talk about uh, how, I mean, just speculate. Okay, then I'll just. So, the one main motivation to look at this for us was the following, which was okay, if you do have randomized benchmark, you have the group, you have the uniform measure. So, you are kind of like in that. that thinking of gate sets and you need them to say you need the Clifford group to just get a single exponent to decay. But um, some work which we did on, on, on Hamiltonian identification was actually uh, in the context of still using a superconducting qubit chip, but as an analog simulator. So you just use directly the Hamiltonian appearing up on that chip in order to kind of like encode a Hubbard, Buzzard, uh, a Buzzard Hubbard style model, uh, but only with one excitation, so you cannot go to higher excitation spaces plus then the interaction. And then you just like, I mean, ramp your qubit frequency transforms to the interaction frequencies to get like, I mean, your Hamiltonian interaction and then you just let the system run, devolve in that. And then you can basically run back. Um, and in these type of settings for the analog regime, um, in this work, we kind of like try to find kind of like, I mean, just look at the data of like a very boring system, namely just quite free dynamics. And just like, I mean, fit the Hamiltonian to this and take the signal processing problem uh, seriously. And for example, one thing which we found is that like the, the what might be in digital quantum computer spam error, like the problem hindering, like, I mean, your precision estimate of like what happens in the, the dynamic part of the evolution um, is that you actually have like REMs in the beginning. So like, I mean, they, they you have to kind of like 
comes from some parking frequency of your qubit, you just ram to the rendezvous frequencies where things start interacting and this is not happening instantaneously. So you, for some period of time, you're actually doing an uncontrolled rotation before like I mean, a very, I mean, basically a very good implementation of your the actual dynamic you're targeting. So like the role of, of spam errors in, in these type of analog simulations, which specifically is kind of like the role of, of RAMs. So now the question is, okay, can we, can we do, I mean, can we analog, can we randomly benchmark these type of things? Uh, and this is also ongoing work. So now, I mean, we still have a reduced representation, especially like in this, I mean, truncating at certain expectation levels, it's finite dimensional representation. So we can actually build filter functions on the different irreducible representations. So this is good. So we can reduce this signal. Instead of thinking about the entire Hilbert space, we can think about subspaces. And then we can start randomizing control. We can just like ram two different Hamiltonians, but we should constrain the ram speed to not lose like basically control. So we, um, and then there's also connectivity constraints in all of the Hamiltonians. So in the end, you end up implementing some measure on that, uh, on that group. Yes. Um, but now we actually have guarantees which in principle are flexible enough to handle this situation. We can just throw this in to some, I mean, most probably numerical analysis of like how we converge to that measure and actually find efficient schemes for, for small irrep to actually target. This, um, happy to have more questions and spend the time on more questions. Yes. Yes, exactly. I mean, I mean, like here, I mean, you could in principle just like, I mean, have instead of observing a matrix power of that, that implementation map, you could have like a different measure every time you do it. Um, and then again, as soon as like, I mean, your measure kind of like just gives you a perturbative, perturbative bound with like different virtual gaps depending on the matrix. So I think, I mean, it should, you should be fairly safe in generalizing this as multiplying kind of a bunch of these operators and then controlling this as, as So if in the case, this is a tricky question. People have started a bit. So in the case that your, your noise model is such that you don't perturb the, the subspaces, so that basically this R1 and L1, like perturbation theory just tells you, you will, you will have the eigenspace, but you will have an eigenspace of the same dimension and it might be rotated by a bit, not too much, but I mean, compared to the original one. But in principle, I mean, the problem is it can be rotated by a lot. So it's not the eigenspaces are not that stable. In case you don't rotate that, for example, if you have depolarizing noise, local depolarizing noise, or something which is sufficiently isotropic in the space, yeah, and these x1 still coincides with the, uh, the, the r1 and the l1 still coincides with the x1. In that case, then you still see the then. Uh, you still see the, the X1 is basically the, the depolarizing channel as respect to that irreducible representation. So for example, um, for the adjoint representation of traces, matrices, it would be actually the, the global depolarizing channel. I mean, module of the trace preserving part. So then you actually see the eigenvalue. 
So then it's an average fidelity. And then this is more generally it's kind of like an average fidelity per irrep, like on every irrep of that thing. The problem with that is if you, I mean, if you start like rotating the eigenspaces too too much, then you lose the interpretation of an average fidelity. So without further assumption on the noise, you don't get there. And in the, the framework, we looked a bit more detailed. And what we found is that like, I mean, the assumption which you have to put in here is basically on the same size of all of them which get out in the end. So you need more assumption about what type of noise is happening in order to have that. But anyway, I mean, it's the, the eigenvalues of the Fourier transform are how, how you like, I mean, perturb the dominant subspace where you actually wanted the original thing to act on. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's kind of like it's literally the the, the generalization of like an effective polarizing strength per area. That's what you would define and fine print. I mean, you might lose this because you're also serving the subspace. The, sorry, the, the, the function is now the implementation map or like what the, the function is there? Yes, yeah. 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 Yes, like, I mean, the, the I lambda is, is similar. Like the I lambda is basically, I mean, for the standard RB case on the, more assumption, the I lambda is just the depolarizing, the effective depolarizing things of like a gate independent point. So, yes. So the question, the. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you didn't, I mean, I we didn't clarify the question. So, like. Can, can you still formulate? The <laughs> okay, okay, we don't record. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I think like in the 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 interesting question, and this is also like I mean something which which I'm sorry, like I mean what you're hinting at, Adam, is kind of like I mean, okay, we, we have like this this Fourier transform of an implementation map involved. So it just gives us the CPT map for our G. If we do some randomized experiment, what do we observe is kind of like the Fourier transform of it. Yeah. And then like, I mean, okay, we know it should be a projector and then we see how it deviates from that projector. And this is kind of like gives us a fidelity measure to begin with. But then like, I mean, you can ask like for more fine grains, like I mean, if it's a smaller group, you can still introduce a lot of fidelity per irrep. Like, I mean, how it acts on, on every commutant of every irrep and so on. And then you can ask these, these more fine grain, fine grain questions. And you can maybe even Ask okay, are we not interested in at least like a like second order error measure? How we deviate, not only on the commutant, on other parts. Yeah. But this is also like I mean something which which I find very interesting that kind of it gives you a more general tool to look at like I mean noise noisy random circuits in a sense like you you here have like a like a perturbative expander which you can plug in in every noisy circuit sounds like every scheme you want to run. And in the regime of fairly good implementation, yeah, you, you get an effective description in terms of like just an effect.
Yes. Yes. Um, it's an yes, 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 and no, like in the sense of like, I mean, yeah, you, I mean, it's a different perturbative expansion, like, I mean, in, in the these type of models, you would typically like, I mean, look at a, at a local noise and then you're kind of like in the order of like only that one local noise appearing while here we're kind of like, I mean, summing over all the noise contributions from the very beginning. So we are not expanding in the noise strength. What we are expanding basically is saying, okay, there's, there's the dominant subspace, which looks like depolarizing noise, or at least depolarizing noise, noise per area. Like, I mean, for the global circuit. So this is kind of like the subspace. And then we see like how, how the, all the other noise kind of decay. So the way like the, the perturbation here decays towards it is the same as like de um, decaying towards it globally. Yes, fall in the language of gate independent noise. Uh, gate dependent noise. Okay, so we don't put like a local dep uh, depolarizing noise or poly noise somewhere, then look how it spreads through the, where we just like, I mean, look at the gate dependent noise. But the regime, the, the regime, I mean, where this formally holds my. Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah, but then, I mean, but you arrive at that expression already after expanding some, having an expansion in the noise. 